doesn't look good at all. I mean, it does look good. So let's tackle the first one. It's complicated, but it's easier than parents and celebration and city. Resentment. I'll tell you a little story, and forgive me for taking it this way, but nothing else comes to mind. My brother is an extrovert. He's very organized, very disciplined. Sometimes he invites me to his classes, sociology, psychology, and I sit back and listen to him talk for the first 5, 10, 15 minutes, and it's amazing how he does his classes filled with information and he's witty and he's really, really good looking. I am so attracted to him as a brother, of course, to brother. And then when he says, I mean, why don't you come up and say a few things? I'm all over the place. Students get confused, and eventually they revolt and kick me out. But as far back as I can go, I remember I always had this deep resentment or envy about the way that he was. Nobody really had to tell him to study. He just studied. When we had gone to India, he was only 10. I was 11 or maybe 11, 12. He would wake up at 2 in the morning, light a candle, and do a study. Who the hell does that? I, on the other hand, would just, you know, stay in bed and have nice dreams. Sure, I would fail all my classes, and he would get A's in all of his classes. And that envy and resentment continued. And it has continued to this day, this moment. I spoke to him before coming to class. And his voice, man, it's like silk. I say, hey, Raj. And he says, hey. Say, oh, my God. What happens when you, like, pick up the phone in your office or pick up the phone at the house? And it happens to be the opposite sex, for example. You know, somebody calls you and says, is it a good time to come and pick up your trash? And all of a sudden, you know, the, the caller forgets the original intention, which was picking out the trash. She says, so are you single? And the point I'm trying to make in making a relatively untrue and funny story is that resentment is a very, very private emotion in the sense that you don't resent Britney Spears. You don't resent Miley Cyrus. You don't resent Diana. You resent specific people. And those specific people are in your life. If, for example, you have a sister, let's just say you are, you are single, you're lonely, and you're depressed. And your sister is not single, not lonely, and not depressed. Well, there are about 9 billion people on this planet. But... You don't envy or resent or are angry because Britney Spears is rich or has a boyfriend or a few of them. You only envy and are resentful towards your sister, and the question is why. And so jealousy is very, very different than resentful, being resentful. You know, you can be lonely, you can walk around the lake, and you can see people holding hands, and you become jealous of them. You know, that chap is so ugly, and yet he has a companion. I, on the other hand, I look great, and nobody even says hello to me. And so you become jealous, and jealousy leads to anger. But resentment is very, very specific in the sense that there are certain people in your life, you look at them, and you say, why do they have that, and I don't. And I think all these emotions ultimately really have to do with just one simple thing. Uh, You don't yet have a stable life. And I don't mean that you just don't have a physical stable life. You don't have an emotional stable life. 
emotionally you're all over the place, intellectually you don't know if you should go to San Diego or Santa Barbara or UCLA or you know Santa Cruz. And then your sister comes to you and says, well, I'm just going to go to San Diego. I have an offer from Yale and Berkeley and Stanford. I don't really care for them. I'm just going to go to Berkeley, for example. And then you say, how could she be so decisive, so quick to make a choice and then act on it? And you say, I want to be like that. You know, if you recall the story I had shared in this class some time ago about the stone cutter. Do you guys remember the, the story? It's about this man... And all of us suffer from this particular, you know, disease, envy and resentment and all that. And I should also point out that resentment and envy, if you can use them the right way, they can help you grow and mature. If, for example, you're an instructor and you invite me to your class, and let's say it's about economics, and you realize that I'm doing such a great job and your students are very, very attracted and inspired by the things I say, you're going to go back to your office and you're going to feel bad for the way you are, for the sort of instructor that you are. And then what you'll do is you'll take some workshops about how to become more effective, a better instructor. And all of a sudden you realize after four or five or six months of doing workshops, you now walk in the classroom and you're able to inspire students even much better than I. And all of a sudden you realize that which created resentment, envy, jealousy, anger, incompetence, all of a sudden help maturing and evolving you. <sighs> Since you now know that you only resent people who are closest to you, the question is, well, what do you do with that? The truth is, there isn't much you can do about any of those things until you yourself find an anchor. In other words, you have to kind of just play with these emotions and make sure that they don't poison you completely. Go to school, be angry, be resentful, be jealous, be envious. Go on your Facebook page and say all these nasty things about your siblings, you know. And then hopefully you'll be done with UCLA and then you'll do your master's and you'll get a job and hopefully you'll find a companion. And then little by little you realize that all the missing pieces that you have at the age of say 19 or 20 and when you're young you have a lot of missing pieces. You want to be happy but what the hell is that? That's a huge puzzle. You want to figure out who you are. That's another big puzzle with a lot of missing pieces. And the truth is, it's partly this culture that tells you at the age of 19, you need to have this puzzle all worked out. And it's really impossible because you don't have cultural narratives that help you. You don't have social media that helps you. You don't have anything in city life that helps you with that. So you're basically on your own. And the point I'm trying to make, you need to toughen up and don't allow, accept the fact that you're just a scum that these emotions have no choice but to live inside you and manifest in some shape or form. You have no choice about those things. The degree to which they want to be manifested, that's to some extent up to you depending on how aware and mindful you are, how able you are to kind of will yourself to control them. But you really just need to wait it out. Um, hopefully in the next 20 years, little by little, you know, and then the funny thing is these emotions are never going to go away completely because you see Ray, for example, he's an 80-year-old man. He sits there quietly. He walks quietly. He speaks quietly. He's very humble, soft-spoken. And then you get to be 65. You know, you have things that Ray didn't have. And then you come to a certain place where you say, yeah, I have things. I'm no longer envious of my sister, but I'm envious of Ray, how despite being somewhat aged, he can kind of just carry himself with so much self-respect. On the other hand, I scream and shout and do all sorts of crazy things. And now you envy him, not so much because he's got money, not so much because he's got degrees, but he's able to carry himself well. And the point is, at every different stage that you enter and occupy, you realize your issues are going to be different. The, the fragrance of envy and resentment and jealousy and anger are going to be different. 
Right now, you're 19 or 20, your sibling is 25, for example, he or she has things that you don't, and you want to be there. And the truth is you can't. It's not going to happen. Um, if you get a chance, any of you in this class, read the works of Jean Paul Sartre. Not all of it, just one play. It's called No Exit. And so much of who we are and so much of the emotions that live inside us really have to do with the people we are surrounded with. You know, if you had a brother who was profoundly incompetent, you wouldn't envy him. He would envy you. And sometimes most of the emotions that we have on the inside really has to do with who is in our life. You know. Um, and if you're able to choose the right people in your life, you can have perhaps the right envy or the right jealousy or the right anger. You know, we had... a question in the class yesterday, someone had asked, can we talk about loneliness and gratitude? I don't want to get into loneliness, but um, the gratitude aspect of it is really interesting. You know, it's one thing to be grateful because you're healthy, you have money, you have a roof over your head, your belly is full. I mean, those basic needs you have, and you should certainly be very proud and very happy and very grateful and thankful. But the other things in life, you work at in and out Sure, it pays rent, but you have wings, man. You have the ability to be creative, to be inspired. You can actually create a revolution if you get to that particular maturity in your life. And yet, you're held hostage by an uncaring society. There is no reason for you to be grateful for that. You need to be angry as hell. There was a movie some years ago, I think it came out in the 1980s, Ray probably has seen, it's called The Network. It's about this news anchor, you know. He keeps being told to kind of share with his audience particular ridiculous stories, you know, the weather being this and uh, the flowers being that. And one day, you know, he's old, he's getting old at least, he wants to retire, he looks at the media, and he says, there is nothing nourishing, it's all nothing but a bunch of lies. And one day, it's, you know, it's, he has to go live. And he's been walking in the rain, and he's a complete mess. The cameras are now zoomed on him, and he looks at the camera and says, you got to be angry, man. You got to be angry as hell. Why do you want to take this? You know, stick your head out. And... Uh, and just, you know, say all these nasty things to your neighbors, to society, to politicians, to whomever. whomever. And the truth is, be, gra be grateful for the basic things that you have in life, but there is no reason for you to be thankful to an uncaring system. You need to be angry. So, resentment, all that stuff, good luck. Uh, just know that most of the dilemmas that we have, they have no quick fixes. It's going to take a long time. So there's that. City life. Every city has a different culture. Every culture creates a different sets of advertisement. The city I was born, let's start with the small city first. That city had my mom, my dad, my grandparents, aunts and uncles. Very small city. Advertisement, religion, politics. Going to the mosque every Wednesday and Friday. When we had guests, it would be politics and religion as conversations. That's my advertisement. There was no sex. No one smoked. No one drank. We had no TV. And the two channels we did have when TV came about were black and white. One was about politics, the other was about religion. When you wanted to go buy something, society didn't really have much to offer you. You didn't have like 50 different kinds of milk, almond milk, vegetable milk, banana milk. There was just one milk. You know, two kinds of bread. 
You know, you didn't go to Safeway, look at the bread shelf and say, oh my God, which am I going to buy? There was no confusion. And just in case you talk too much, they would slap you. Rightly so. You couldn't cry too much. You couldn't scream too much. They were the forms of advertisement that we had. So how were we socialized? You never talk back to your parents. You take school very seriously. Just because you got money, it doesn't mean that you have value. If you have education, you have value, but money doesn't make you valuable. Now, you're talking about city life today. Now, let's start with the small city, your parents. First of all, the narratives about parenthood have changed in the last maybe 50, 60 years in this, in this country. Second, the narrative about what it means to be happy has changed. The narrative about what makes you you has changed. Everything about this culture and the narratives that have been around for thousands of years, they no longer work. So what you have are basically narratives that give birth only to confusion. You have too many options now. So the small city is your parents. They're far too busy to take care of you. Now to the fact that you're far too privileged and entitled, so you demand ridiculous things from your parents. You want to be coddled. Right? Because things happen to be so expensive, you have no choice but to be raised by foreigners. Walk around the lake and you'll see Hispanics, Eritreans, Ethiopians having to take care of kids who don't look like them, smell like them, right? And so you also have a system called capitalism that creates ambitions that people didn't have for the longest time in our history. The only thing that a woman wanted to do, find a relatively good man, get married, have a few kids, raise decent children, because your reputation had to do with the sort of children you would raise and give to society. Now you have a woman who wants to be a man, a CEO, educated, rich, independent, at the same time, be a mother and be married. It's too many things. <sighs> For the longest time, the advertisement that would come to you came from relatively trustworthy sources. Your parents always wanted the best for you. Go to school. Now, you know, you go online, YouTube, Yahoo. Oh, you don't have to go to school to become rich. Have a hot dog stand somewhere out there. And who, who's doing this? I don't know. Some guy who has a company. Doesn't really care for you. You know, it's kind of like um, Amway. You guys know Amway? In a very nice, cunning, clever way, you exploit other people. You give them false advertisements. They go out there like dogs. They make a cent. But you make a buck. That's what Amway is. Now, there are two things that are waiting for you. Um, you can either be aware living in a society such as this, or you could be unaware. If you're unaware, you'll just kind of fall victim to advertisement until you get to be my age or raise age. You look at your, your life, you realize it's been a waste. Or you can be aware at the age of 20, only to realize that whatever society gives you and you want to, like, Put it in your mouth and chew and swallow, you're going to suffer from diarrhea. If you live in society with a good amount of awareness, that's the cross you have to bury, carry. And your friendships are going to be very, very few. Your conversations, very, very few. The times during the day you're going to smile, maybe two or three. Is there a way out? No. Good luck.
Are you a Muslim, Peter? You should be. Okay. I'm just kidding. Uh, there is this, in the Islamic tradition, there are five pillars or five posts or five anchors on which you stand and build your house. One of them is called fasting. Now, fasting comes in two ways. You can either do it because it is ritualistic, it's traditional, it's something that your community has been doing for a thousand years or so. Your parents do it, your siblings do it, your aunts and uncles do it, your neighbors do it, so you just follow the tradition. The other aspect of fasting is the following. You come to realize that you're addicted to certain ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. And the ways you feel and think and act are poison to your system. They won't help you. You have a class every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to, say, 10, 15. But for the past, say, five years, 9 to 10, 15 is reserved to smoke, hang out with your friends, or maybe just lay in bed. So <clears throat> your mom one day comes to your room and says, son, I know Tuesdays and Thursdays have been reserved for you just being comfortable. You need to abstain from that now. You need to make some sacrifices. And you say, what kind of sacrifices? She says, I signed you up for philosophy class Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 10.15. You need to get yourself up, shower, dress well, overcome certain habits in feeling and thinking. It's going to be new and it's going to be tough. And all of a sudden you realize this particular kind of fasting, or maybe you'll decide on your own that you want to do this. Let's say someone asks about resentment, that I look at my sister or my brother and I'm hella angry because they are something I want to be and I want to be that, but I can't. And so every time you go home and you look at your sister or your brother and you want to be angry with them, you abstain from it. You become aware, but that's the first thing. You need to become aware first. Once you become aware, now the conflict begins. Should I go back to the old system? Should I adopt a new system, unknown system? I have no idea where it's going to take me, but should I go there? And there's always going to be this, this yo-yo syndrome. You're going to spend 80% of your energy thinking about the old, 20% on the new. The old you're familiar with. Every time you see your brother, you're angry. The new is, well, my brother is five years older. My brother is this. My brother is that. You exercise some awareness, empathy, sympathy, compassion, understanding. But the problem with this new form is that it puts the old you in check and you won't like it. So if there are things in society you don't like in the city life. Have you guys ever seen the movie um, Horse Whisperer? With Robert Redford, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, and Snoop Dogg? No. Uh, the movie came out in the, I don't know, 90s, early 90s. Uh, Robert Redford, I think, when he was a young lad, he came to, went to Washington, you know, went to school there, got a nice job, stayed there for about 5, 6, 10, 20, 15 years. But all of a sudden, his memory went back to the farm that he, they had in Wyoming. And one morning, he just decided to quit city life and go back to Wyoming, be a rancher, raise horses and cows and donkeys. And he was quite content. Whenever you want some change, uh, it first begin with this, begins with this hint of awareness. You become aware of something. That awareness creates pain. Pain creates a good amount of abstraction. Then after 20 years, you say, I've been feeling and thinking about the same thing day in and day out. I need to make some physical changes. And then like Robert Redford in the movie Horse Whisper, you pack up your stuff and you move. But it took only 20 years. So if there are anything about the city life that you don't like, continue not liking them. And once you get to a boiling place, if you ever get there, then you'll make the appropriate changes. You know, so many students in the past many years, they say, Oakland is a great place. What's so great about Oakland? You know, diversity is good as long as it doesn't lead into chaos.
there's poverty, there's homelessness. Did you guys know that on Saturday, this past Saturday, they found a dead homeless person on campus? Yeah, Lenny. Yeah, yeah. Carjacking, people jacking. Say again. Sister got what? Okay, let's um, talk about some things that are private. You share a bit of your privacy with other people, and now they want to make you feel better. That was your question, right, Thomas? Okay. I think it's a natural inclination when someone shares with you a story that's sad that you do want to walk to them, over to them, and maybe shake their hand or give them a hug. Uh, or if you were in my culture, you would, you know, kiss them on the cheeks and just say my condolences and walk away. So I think all of us naturally, when you hear something that's sad, we are moved into empathy. It's just a natural thing for us. It's very organic. And I think sometimes when people hear something that comes out of you and it happens to be rather sorrowful, they want to make you feel better. Now, all you really wanted to do was to share a news. You didn't ask for advice. You were not asking for a remedy. All you want to say is, by the way, A, B, C, D happened. I'm sad. But they didn't say, I am sad. Is there a way out of my sadness? They just said, I'm sad. But people have a tendency of crossing certain lines. And they don't do it because they're mean-spirited. They really do want to empathize and sympathize. Uh, it's something we do naturally. But there is something you need to know about the nature of pain. The pain of losing a sister, the pain of losing a parent, or the pain of having parents, but only to realizing they're really not good parents at all. Or maybe, you know, they tried their best, but it wasn't enough. Pain has a tendency of always pushing you into this very, very lonely spot. Always. And the more intense the pain, the more lonely you are. And the more lonely you feel, the more isolated, alienated, strange you feel. And the more sorrow you have inside you. And as long as you have a good amount of sorrow, you don't have to be religious. You just pray. And sometimes your prayer comes in the form of, I just want to get better. I want to understand. You know, you want answers. And not so much answers you want to understand. You just want to feel a different way. <sighs> so that's the first thing about pain. You kind of just find yourself completely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what if you don't mind about it? What if you need loneliness to overcome experience? 